Inhumans 2017 show review. As any fan knows, Inhumans are this fascinating group of well-written characters that we really come to care about, trying to figure out how or even if they can coexist with regular human beings. Well, that's what they are in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on this show. Oh boy. I'm going to start by telling you this was a show that I found to be painfully average. This video will have some jokes and we'll get into some serious topics. And let's see. Yes, I realize this video is long. I'm going to can to make it worth your time. And I will not be spoiling anything about the show itself in this video, but I might spoil the MCU leading up to the show. If you want my spoilerful thoughts on individual episodes of the show, the link to the my overall MCU playlist will be in the description box. And let's see. Yeah. Um, so the plot. It is indeed set in 2017, and the yeah, there's this coup attempt that leaves the the inhumans you know going from the moon to Hawaii and yeah they have to try to find a way to, to you know get back to the moon and yeah um this is very much a show that expects you to already know a lot, which I don't think has to be a problem. I think the problem arises from the fact that it doesn't really make you care about these Inhumans. It just kind of hopes that you care about Inhumans based on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. seasons 2 through 4. And maybe the, the comics. I, I don't think I've read any Inhumans comics. I haven't been avoiding them or anything. But the... Yeah, this very much expects you to care about the royal family and doesn't do a lot to try to make you care. But yeah, uh, for sure, you, you kind of do need to know at least some about Inhumans. I'm not sure you have to watch all four seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but certainly I would say... At least the first three seasons is probably good, you know, to to get an idea of because there's there's stuff mentioned on this show that happened on in the the yeah on Agents of Shield in in seasons two and three that really you know yeah this show doesn't even try to explain hypothetically I would say you could overall follow it. Um, I, I would recommend watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. seasons 1 through 4, or at least through 3, first. In part because I don't think, if this is the first you're exposed to, to Inhumans in the MCU, I'm not, I, I worry that you're going to not give them a chance at all on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and I would argue they're one of the best elements of that really excellent show. I, I, you know, having watched the first four seasons, I haven't watched 5, 6, and 7 yet, but... Those first four seasons are amazing. So, this was handled by Scott Buck, who also equally, perhaps not equally, but also made a mess of the first season of Iron Fist. Season two of Iron Fist is much, much better. And if, you know, if you're struggling to get through, if you've made up your mind you want to watch all of Iron Fist season one, once you get past those first three episodes, it does get much, much less painful to watch. I hesitate to say better. Scott Bug has not really done anything since these two, and that is probably... Like, I, I hate to say, you know, oh, this person just shouldn't work. I don't, I don't have a personal problem with Scott Buck. I just think maybe it's a different field, or he should not, he should at least not be showrunner, you know, because he does not really see, like, I think he did good work on Dexter, you know, he wasn't the, the creator of that show, so maybe that's the, the kind of, but, but yeah. 
and let's see. Um, yes, so so a really good quote from I believe this is a user review. It's it's someone else's review. Frank Sinatra and others saying about the best things in life being free, but at least now the same is true of the worst things. Who and what we're supposed to be rooting for is maybe the biggest flaw in a series of insurmountable flaws and a crucial bit of storytelling writer Scott Buck was unable to crack. And this person gave it a 1 out of 10. So the pilot is fine. It's not the worst. And you can definitely tell it's where a lot of the money went. Um... I, I do think that the, the pilot does one thing really well, and that is to warn you about the rest of the show. Because when you watch the pilot, you're like, wow, this is terrible. And yeah, you know, there's, that's, that's the warning. That's the canary in the, in the coal mine. You know, there's just, it, it doesn't really get better. Um, but yeah, you know, the pilot, it sets up, a lot of the the major most of the major characters of the show and yeah sets up some of the places that are important and some major plot points the the finale is actually not as bad as i kind of feared it would be um yeah it was, there's there's definitely stuff that works about the the finale and it is you know by the very end, it does finish off the, the story. It, it basically, it opens up to a new chapter, which I'm not sure we're ever going to get. Um, but they were clearly thinking that they would get uh, a second season. Now, I have, as mentioned, I haven't read Inhumans. I do uh, understand from, from reading that, you know, from reading stuff from people who have read the comics, there are some changes made here. Based on, you know, it doesn't sound like they did... It kind of sounds like they needed to change more things. I, I think, you know, it's one of those things where... So, the Inhumans in the comics... I'm going to make sure I get the year right. So, the... The very first appearance was 1965, and there are some, a lot has changed in, in the years since, you know, so this is basically, yeah, when, when this show aired, it had been 52 years since they first appeared, and yeah, I can imagine that a lot of the kind of stuff that's on the show it's I can imagine it's in the comics and it was probably this thing of like yeah you know back then that was thought of as 100 percent fine you know and and certainly if you choose to view it as mythology which you know a, a certain chunk of superhero comics it is basically mythology it's modern mythology and and yeah you know if, like if that was the the way that they had approached it for this show, you know, and, and basically just said, okay, technically sort of MCU, whatever, we're kind of going to do a mythology thing instead. But that's not really what they did. That This has the same kind of fairly close to real-world real realism kind of thing that the MCU has always had, you know. We, you know, there's a, there's a couple of exceptions. There are times where the MCU gets much, you know, more far out, but, you know, when they introduced Thor, they said, no, 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 it's it's not mythology, it's not, you know, like magic, it's science. It's just a different, it's it's a really advanced science. That's, that's what it really is, you know. And, yeah, like, imagine if someone took a Greek myth, myth or North, Norse myth, and just, you know, made an ad, you know, yeah, made an adaptation where it was basically, oh, it's now set in the real world. Well, suddenly, it it's like, what? You know, like, the, the kind of stuff that you have in mythology works in mythology. It works as stories trying to make sense of the world. And that's not what we have uh, with, with this show. It just kind of acts like we're supposed to think 
that this is all okay when it just yeah um the 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 show presents us with a eugenicist rule where there's this caste system there's slavery you know the good news is that there is a major character who is trying to to get rid of that trying to stop the eugenicism before it leads to, to genocide you know if you if you look at the 10 stages of genocide the show the, the you know Adelan, the city on the moon that the Inhumans, you know, live and rule, and some of them rule, you know, yeah, it, it has reached five or six stages of the ten, and keeping in mind, the ninth one is eradication. I say five or six because, you know, an argument could be made for the, the I want to say it was the fifth one, but one through four and six, for sure. The good news is, there's a major character seemingly trying to, to, you know, overturn all that. The bad news is, he's the villain. He is the main villain, and the show really struggles with this, like... It feels like it was made by people who just don't think that you should change something like that. And, and again... If this was like either mythology or like ancient, uh, maybe not ancient, but like an, a really old story, like several hundred years old, you know, yeah, we could appreciate, oh, you know, yeah, yeah back, back then, that's how they thought. But today, and again, it's set today. They know about Earth. They know about, that's again, if it was this completely, I mean, they are isolated but they know about earth you know they know that a lot of earth has democracy and it doesn't seem like in in an, in one of the first episodes they actually do bring up you know well you know this is how we're doing things and maximus or max which i call him because that apparently annoys the crap out of the character the villain, he points out to the royal family, I mean, maybe, you know, we're, we're doing this, maybe we should be doing this, and here's why. And they just kind of shake their heads like, this guy, enough with the anti-eugenicist, anti-slavery stuff, like, come on. And, and just, yeah, the show really, really... I'm not saying that there's no such thing as enjoying a piece of media that has values that are very different from your own. I do find myself sometimes enjoying something, you know, it, it just, sometimes you just gotta turn your brain off and, and you know, in, be able to enjoy something. You can fight it afterwards, you can speak out against it afterwards, but how are you supposed to do that when they're literally I feel like a broken record here. Yeah. Eugenicist, pro-slavery, and, and, you know, royalist. It just... And, and pro-caste system. Just, yeah. One of the obvious problems with doing Inhumans on television on a television budget is that there are a number of fantastical elements. And I want to start by saying the following is not criticism of comic books as a medium. It is less costly, I'm not saying it's easy, or requires no talent, to draw something outlandish, outlandish on a page than it is to do convincing special effects for a live-action show. And obviously, if you drop too many of the more out-there elements, it starts to feel like you're not really adapting the comic. And, and this is very much a show that, like... I think the original pitch... Other than the fact that, you know, apparently, like, a big part of why this was not a movie, as, you know, originally this was supposed to be one of the, you know, MCU movies, a $150 million MCU theatrically released movie, and they even, you know, they actually did release the first two episodes in IMAX, and I don't, you know, a, 
a lot of people, I, I haven't myself seen it like that, but a lot of people pointed out, it's not a movie, it's, it's a TV pilot, you know. The fact that, like, I'm sure some of it look cool in IMAX, but it's very much a television pilot. It just, I, and, you know, I say that as someone who loves, you know, I, I think that, again, having watched the first four, you know, seasons of, of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you know, honestly, I think basically every season opener of MCU TV is is quite good, you know, not, not Iron Fist, but, yeah, the rest of them have really strong pilots, but I wouldn't want... I don't think they would fit in, of um, in a cinema, you know, but but yeah, the reason that this was not a movie is apparently at least in part that Kevin Feige did not want the the TV side of of Marvel, you know, to to even you know a lot of this stuff does technically supposedly take place in the MCU but the movies don't really reference it he didn't want to change that he didn't want a movie that was so closely tied and at that point like first of all they should probably have just been like I mean we can't do Inhumans on a TV budget that's just not a thing like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. does have a number of superpowers but they're always very careful to not you know have too many, and here, I mean, there's maybe like 10 characters with superpowers that require special effects that are major or main characters on this show. Like, what are you going to do? And, you know, of course, the answer that they came up with was, we're going to write a lot of them out. We're going to contrive reasons for why, you know, it, it doesn't work. This guy's power is his brain. Knock him on the head. This, you know, this this person has has really, you know, expensive stuff, you know, related to the their powers. See if you can limit their screen time as much as possible, and and you know, just all of this stuff, and and just yeah, um, but yeah, they they you know, someone probably Ike Perlmutter, was super stubborn about making the Inhumans a thing, you know. Ike Perlmutter wanted the Inhumans to, you know, to be their X-Men, you know. And, and yeah, in 2017, X-Men drew pretty, pretty decently, you know. This was before the, the Fox merger, Fox-Disney merger, you know. Yeah, the... the he kept trying to push a square peg into a round hole, and there's just there's so many different aspects of this show where you can see that they just refused to just accept these you know yeah the the limitations that they were they were dealing with. Honestly, if this had just been 2D animation, I could see that you know um, something. Let's see. I, I I'm not sure it would work quite as well if they just did it like the '92 through '97 X-Men show, but you know, an an animated show of of yeah. It's, but the the let's see. Um, yeah, the show makes many mistakes. This is one of them. The villain is way too. Correct. How are we supposed to side with a royal family who are in favor of slavery over a revolutionary who, at least at first, is literally just trying to free slaves? Like, a sympathetic villain is something the MCU goes for ever so often. Loki in the original Thor, Killmonger. But the people they're fighting against are good people. As far as we know, none of their people are slaves, despite the fact that they are, you know, a prince and a king, respectively. And the thing is, you could so easily reverse it. Just have the royal family get rid of slavery. Maybe they're the first royal family to do so. But they've reached that conclusion from research and ethics. And the, and the villain is someone who believes that their society will fall apart without slavery. You know, like the, the South starting the Civil War. Of course, this might alienate conservative viewers, even though you know, a lot of the MCU tries to have a, a reasonably left-leaning, you know, 
Not far enough for my taste, but, you know, somewhat left-leaning. But, yeah, just, like, it's so easy. It's it's right there, you know. If, you know, even if you want to say, oh, the, they've had slavery for, for generations, you know, you, you could just make it that. The production largely looks cheap. The special effects are overly ambitious, and after the first few episodes, you know, a lot of the the Inhumans uh, right after the first few episodes have a lot of use of Inhuman powers there's significantly less of it that in later episodes they probably overspent on those early episodes which don't actually look that impressive Medusa's wig is unconvincing the costumes are slightly silly looking you know it, it just the the CG it just it, it pushes a little bit too far, you know. It was Adelan, the this city, you know, housing fourteen hundred people. You know, it's it's on the moon. You have all this stuff that like clear like they they could not have done this with like. It, actually, you know what? Actually, think about. It. I think some of it could have been done with models, but there's definitely some of it that, that just couldn't have, and they just they sh they needed to rewrite that stuff. And and at the end of the day, I I don't think this needed the moon to be the the like if you had just said oh they live in a you know on Earth but in part of the Earth that hasn't really been explored like again. Black Panther, you know, this was the same year as the first Black Panther movie, which specifically says there are, you know, the 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 people of Wakanda have this amazing technology that no one in in the rest of the world has has you know ever seen the likes of, but they've been able to keep it hidden. Just have that because they already have, like Adelan has the the in you know what's it called invisible. Yeah, it it it's it has this dome that is invisible. Have that be somewhere on Earth. That's that's it, and and use sets and you know location shooting instead of of having to yeah. And yeah, to most viewers, Maximus' stance of helping the lower class seems significantly more appealing than King Blackbolt's reliance on traditions and just letting things happen so you know they have to make max unappealing in other ways and the fact that he was chosen as the villain is just... apparently it is not 100 percent certain that it was ike perlmutter but it does sound like he at the very least would approve of you know, because, yeah, it is, you know, basically the show seems to think that the powerful should not be questioned and, you know, we, regular people should hate fighting for the lower class. It just, yeah, it, it feels completely out of, of touch and... Again, like, if this had been made when the comic first, you know, yeah, if, if this, if I was reviewing this as something that had come out in 1967 or something, 1965, right after the comic, you know, yeah, I mean, I'd still have issue with the politics, but at least it would be, you know, it's, it's of its time. But this, this is like fighting back against like I, I get it this came out you know during Trump's presidency you know maybe some of the people working on this were convinced that the tide was turning that this would be you know yeah conservatism would would manage to to hold power for for a long time and they were trying to make government propaganda because certainly, like, it's not difficult to read Trumpism into the royal family here. Like, yeah. 
the the you know the fact that they don't really listen to to opposing views they don't do they don't act selflessly they don't you know that yeah it's it, it might makes right the the show doesn't really try to to convince us that they should have power it's just like they have power that means you have to do what they say and that's it there's no other you know i i get that that maybe they thought that because of trump but that's ignoring the fact that trump had a lot of like there as long as trump has been at all political like right from when he announced his candidacy and i want to say 2015 from the very start there's been a very vocal opposition you know the the there's there's uh there are hundreds of millions of people who just hate him and and you know don't want him to have power so it feels very it, it, it kind of contrarian just very it, it's there's a refusal to accept that this is not you know and and again Agents of Shield specifically criticizes Trump. There's some there are some very very significant parts of season four of Agents of Shield that like oh wow this that was that was about Trump that was definitely about Trump, you know and it's and and honestly also season season three but season four was specifically after you know they, they were making that after Trump was elected and. Yeah, they they use that to criticize, and and that's you know maybe this was you know maybe I Pearl Mutter maybe someone else trying to fight back against that. Maybe they were trying to say, oh good, yeah, let's let's calm down here. Maybe Trump isn't so bad. I think it's meant to make Max unappealing that he wants war with the humans of Earth, since everyone watching the show is a human of Earth, and. The fact that he's against taking in the refugees caused by the end of season two of Agents of Shield, the Terrigen getting into Earth's water supply, but it feels like you know the the show invented these to try to make him look like a callous populist when really he appears to be the voice of the people. And while taking in refugees is something that every country that is able to should do, he claims in the show that they don't have the resources, and no one seems to really disagree with him on that. I guess they just don't care. Like, they kind of come across as not really taking seriously the actual problems they're faced with, which is just, like, a complete... That, 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 um, this qualifies you from politics if you can't take... Uh, it should. Hopefully, at some point in the future, that will be the case. And, yeah, he, you know, it sounds like he's just being realistic. Like... In the real world, there definitely are countries right here on Earth that currently are not in a position where they can actually support refugees or other immigrants. And if it was attempted anyway, then both the refugees and the native borns would just end up miserable. I guess Max is supposed to come across as a callous, modern conservative here in the West, motivated by xenophobia. But that's really not what he is if they actually don't have the resources. You know, America does have the resources. It's just a matter of political will. America could easily take in a lot of refugees. And no one's asking them to take in more than they could. But, you know, it's it's the rich and powerful who want to keep that money for themselves. You know, they, they don't want... They don't want to help people. They don't want people who aren't rich and powerful to, to do well. Now... See. Right, and when I say rich and powerful, I'm not talking about the Jews. You know, I'm not talking about Jewish people. This is not an anti-Semitic conspiracy. I'm, you know, most of these people are white. Let's see. Um, right, it's not automatically a problem for a piece of media to feature a number of characters that make bad decisions so that plot can happen. Some of the best movies ever made require this. However, this show is packed with characters who are con constantly going back and forth between whether their decision making makes sense or not and whether you know whether it's consistent with their of let's see makes i need to get better at proofreading my scripts 
Um, right, whether it's consistent with their other decisions. It's a show where if clearly smart people didn't take baffling courses of action, it would be over in a fraction of the actual running time, and I and many others find ourselves wishing it had. I appreciate that a coup d'etat may have been thought of as being too serious to not have something lighter even things out. This is the MCU after all, but there's entirely too much fish out of water comedy in the show. I won't reveal if it ever happens, but for a chunk of this, you don't see a single S.H.I.E.L.D. agent or any other authority, which just feels ridiculous considering some of the stuff they responded to in some of the you know, yeah, some of the seasons. Basically, the story would have had to have the Inhumans on Earth in the show not attract any attention, but they do almost immediately after arriving on Earth. It simply is not credible that this is taking place in the same universe as Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., considering this and... Uh, see, considering this, after that show spent three seasons on Inhumans, and again, it clearly is because it specifically references Terragenesis on Earth, you know, which happened at the very end of Season 2 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and is then dealt with over the course of Season 3. Didn't happen in the movies, so it's not that, you know, they're just going off. Yeah. So there's this female scientist, Louise, looking into Moon in Humans, she feels really overplayed. Like, we get it, Hollywood thinks nerds are hilarious, but it's just really obnoxious. Characters who we are clearly meant to sympathize with will treat badly people who are just trying to help them, talking about how they're superior to them, and the show doesn't try to reconcile this. I mean, we're basically watching the 1% push around the 99%. I mean, my god, at least Batman supposedly helps people, despite his fascism. The bad guy is trying to get rid of the eugenics system, and the audience is just meant to go along with this. When eugenics is one of the worst ideas we human beings have ever come up with, like literally used to justify genocide, we're supposed to worry that the villain might actually get rid of it. I'm certain that the comics has some of these things, but again, you know, if for sure, if it was like pro eugenics, then it would, then then it. We're talking about comics from, from, yeah, you know, 50 years ago. Let's see. And, and yeah, stuff like this should have been removed or heavily changed. This screams of being made by someone who's out of touch, touch with what a huge chunk of young people actually consider ethical. And at the end of the day, these are made primarily for young people. I think Max is supposed to be like, I should have looked his name up, the, the villain from Gladiator. So let's see, his name is Commodus. You know, and, you know, in that story, they actually managed to convince us he is a terrible person. And they really struggle with that on this show. I can't speak to which of these two actors is more talented. I do believe that the guy playing Max is substantially more talented than he gets to show in the in in this show because I know a few of the actors here and they are just so much more Let's see, I'm going to find it real quick. The the ones I know from a What the hell was that? Wow. Uh, okay, I know for a fact this has its own... Here we go. Holy crap. Okay, yes. Um, the ones I know for a fact are really great elsewhere. Are Ken Loom and the... Let's see. Henry Ian Cusick. Poor guy just can't seem to make it off. An island where he has to deal with overly long, overly convoluted stories about you know, stuff that doesn't quite exist in the real world. They're both excellent elsewhere, but they're really not... I will say, Ken has moments. You know, but yeah, for a lot of it, just they're, they're not particularly good, and yeah, it's, you know, there, there's that saying about if the... 
um, if every performance is bad, then it's the it's bad direction. Yeah, um, Ian Rayon, I guess is how you pronounce it. Um, he's Welsh. He was on Game of Thrones. He played Ramsay Bolton. And yeah, um, I've heard really great things about his performance on that. I haven't watched Game of Thrones. Probably won't. Yeah, you know, the, the, I think there are some actors on, on the show that like, I mean, um, I, I can imagine there's at least some that are not like super established, uh, you know, haven't really proven that they're talented elsewhere. But yeah, you know, the the some of the incredibly talented people on on this show don't get to show that they're talented here. The show starts by introducing us to the very various characters, then splits up a bunch of them and. Unfortunately for the show, we in the audience, a lot of us at least, don't particularly want them to be reunited, and that's the major narrative thrust. The action on the show struggles primarily because the editing, some of the choreography is legitimately good, but it's chopped up in a way that can be difficult to follow. The geography and choreography are difficult to make out and keep track of. It jumps swiftly back and forth between quick cuts, where the camera is entirely too close for us to get a good sense of what's going on, and medium and long shots that you know, okay, now you can see what's going on, but they don't really get across the emotion intended, though it is, you know, at least nice that we can finally see what's happening. I realize not everybody can direct action. Maybe the directors on this were chosen for how, you know, well, how they direct actors, I've just talked about. But action is, you know, if if you have a director who's not great at directing action, you know, that's what second unit is for. There's a lot of, you know, stories today where action movies and shows have second unit direct action. Ones who are really, really good at specifically that. Because for sure, it's very difficult to, to direct action well. Most of the characters we're supposed to sympathize with have incredibly negative traits, which would be fine if this was properly confronted, but it comes across as if we're supposed to think, oh well, they're the good guys, they're the royal family, they have power, we have to accept them the way they are. There is some character growth, but it takes entirely too long and feels unearned. It's too, li too little too late. The pacing is terrible. This is incredibly drawn out. You know, it's extremely clear it was conceived as a movie and later turned into a show. It's eight episodes when it probably should have been two and a half. And yes, this does mean that the very start and the very end of the show, you know, that's where like major plot stuff happens. Now, I'm not entirely sure that that what that is what the movie probably would have been. You know, I, I let's see, I, I did a little. Uh, let's see. From research, I found that, let's see, yeah, uh, yeah, the show is very different from the original plan for the movie. Um, yeah, in the movie, the Inhumans were supposed to be introduced as a hidden civilization on the moon with no contact on Earth, uh, no can contact with Earth, and the show focuses on the family drama and the culture clash the movie would have been more of a spectacle and a cosmic adventure, and I absolutely think that could have worked. But but yeah, you know, the entire middle chunk of the show is incredibly padded. Think like the Obi-Wan show, the Book of Boba Fett, and I say that as someone who does love a lot of Disney Star Wars. The show will act as if we care about characters that have been barely set up, some that might even disappear for long chunks. On more than one occasion, an episode will end with a seemingly interesting setup for future episodes, but not a single one of them actually delivers. There's there's this one bit that's actually, like, they set something up, and then they do nothing with it, and it's like, wow, if someone really wanted this to be eight episodes, and you couldn't even, like, as much as 
a lot of the time, nothing even really happens on the show. It's just people, like... It's the royals stuck in situ in certain circumstance where they have to deal with, with humans and, you know, maybe gradually come to realize that we're not, you know, something stuck under their boot. And, and just, yeah, it, that, even with that, even with all of that padding, they still had to actually come up with something that doesn't at all have, you know, make any impact. Honestly, I wouldn't rule out that one thing might even be like they, a, there might be like a forced rewrite because they really seemed like they were going somewhere, and then it's just resolved in with without it making any actual impact. Now, the fact that this show does not have subtitles for Black Bolt's sign language works fine when there's other characters directly translating, but it gets very awkward when there's a conversation and the other person has to restate what Black Bolt said, and really, they could easily just have used subtitling, just like they, the MCU did years later on Echo, the, the recent show, you know. Just, it's, it's completely unnecessary see and I think that might be about yeah I think a, um, an argument could also be made that the show is just too weird for a mainstream audience and I think that is about Yeah, um, there is some good location shooting, you know, Hawaii looks amazing, that's not a surprise to anyone. And, let's see, the, the score is, is fine, and, yeah, so I, I mentioned that there's eight episodes. The the episodes are around 40 minutes. It's, you know, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, this is this is the part where I try to force myself to say something positive. Um. I mean, I, I definitely do think that the show, there, there is one thing that I do really appreciate about this show, and, and I, I cannot overstate how relieved I am that this was the case. And that is, of course, the fact that it eventually ends, because these have been the longest eight days of my life. I, I watched an episode per day, something I don't really recommend. You should probably space it out more if you're gonna watch more than one episode, and I don't think you should. Yeah, just, yeah. The, the worst aspect of the, the show is definitely the, the technical aspects and the ethical, yeah, the way it treats these ethical issues. Something I've seen others criticize is the, the special effects, and that's definitely also very true. Um, yeah, I was I was worried it was going to live down to, to the many, many criticisms I've, I've read over the years, and yeah, it absolutely did. And yeah, I was honestly looking forward to, like, Ken Leung really is so good elsewhere. And it is kind of interesting that, like, so basically, yeah, um, let's see. Ken Lung plays Karnak, and uh, there's a quote here from executive producer of the show, Jeff Loeb. Because of Karnak's ability, everything he sees is flawed. Nothing is quite good enough for him. It's at the point where the glass isn't half empty, it's shattered. And, you know, other than the fact that that really does sound a lot like his character on Lost. Yeah, you know, that is... Yeah, maybe Ken Leung just kind of likes characters like that. I feel like that's... 
anyway, um, yeah, that absolutely, it's something I've seen him done well elsewhere, do well elsewhere, and it's just, yeah, the, the fact that, it's, it's just, yeah, um, but yeah, uh, whether we're talking the season opener, the season finale, or the overall season, none of them are all that, you know, like, I guess if we're grading on a curve, if we're going by all the stuff that's wrong with the show, it's not the worst thing ever, but it's not, I, I can't really call it good. And on Rotten Tomatoes, this has an 11% from critics and a 43% audience score. That's very high for audience. Honestly, reading some of the reviews, it kind of sounds like some of these people are just really, you know, some, some people have waited for decades to see the Inhumans adapted to, to you know, so, yeah. And, and for sure, there's Inhumans here. It, it does what it says on the tin. There are, you know, yeah, like I mentioned, you know, there's maybe 10 or more characters that have inhuman powers and yeah the consensus uh, marvels and human sets a new low standard for the mcu with an unimaginative narrative dull design work weak characters and disengaging soapy melodrama yeah of the 47 reviews uh I'm supposed to say it's somewhere around here But I guess it's not going to. Um, if I click that, it's just going to take me here. Okay, I guess we're screwed on that front. It's not going to give me a breakdown of, but yeah, there's 47 reviews and 11%. Not the hardest math to do, I'll concede. And on Metacritic, it has 27 out of 100, generally unfavorable, based on 20 critic reviews, 12 of them negative, 8 mixed. Not a single person gave this a positive, not a single critic gave this a positive review. And the, uh, let's see, the user score is 4.5 out of 10. So again, some of them liked it substantially more. Um, yeah, there are three reviews, a zero, a three, and a six. The three says, this might be the worst show I've ever seen, complete and utter garbage on almost every level. Yeah, well put. And, let's see. Yeah, the, the one who gave it a six says, flawed execution. And there are 229 user ratings, 108 of them are negative, 81 are positive, and 40 are mixed. And on IMDB, it has a 4.9 out of 10 based on 29,000 ratings, 15.8% gave it 5, 14.8 gave it 6. 11.6 gave it 7, 11.4 gave it 1, 11.3 gave it 4, 9.7 gave it 10. Some people really loved it. 8.4 gave it 3, 6.9 gave it 8, 6.4 gave it 2, and 3.7 gave it 9. There are 329 user reviews, or 253, if you don't count spoilers. I tried to read, but after a while, it just, they kind of, they kind of just flow together in this gray mass of, of misery and shattered expectations, you know. I read at least the top voted 100. So, yeah, the, the, The special effects in detail, I do th think that some of the prosthetic makeup is quite good. It does get kind of awkward with how eager they are to not show 
the character Gorgon's hooves, which clearly, you know, there's a lot of the time, either you can only see the hooves and it's like, oh, yeah, okay, there's a, there's a puppeteer, you know, there's probably some poor guy bent over with his arms in those so he can manipulate them more easily you know or you'll see like a really distant shot and maybe there maybe he won't be really moving because they're almost definitely it's you know it's easier to just build them around the actor the actor's legs instead of actually having to make ones that he can walk around in and and yeah like just don't have the character in there you know it it just yeah um and and yeah, for like, there's some really solid facial prosthetics, and the the yeah, I th I think that's pretty much all positive I can say about the you know the special effects. Other than that, like the visual effects, all the CGI is just they they push it past what they can make look convincing. Um, the the yeah there's some awkward chroma key yeah um one of them one of the characters is lockjaw the the massive teleporting dog and i appreciate that they wanted the dog to be you know what's the word they wanted it to actually be as big let's see yeah uh, it's 2,000 pounds, or 910 kilograms in real numbers, and yeah, um, it's created through CG, and I, I get that, you know, maybe they, they, maybe they didn't want to have to deal with, like, because, you know, I appreciate sometimes, you know, dealing with a, an on-set dog and, and trainer, sometimes that's annoying. I don't think CG was the right choice because at the end of the day, like, literally, once you have the actual dog, you can use, you know, tricks, visual sleight of hand to make it look like it's as big. And then it's just, you know, okay, technically it isn't as big as that. You know, like... Years upon years before this show, there was a movie called Honey, I Blew Up the Kit from 1992. There is a lot of, like, a, a lot of the, the kid, the, the, the baby, that's, like, moving around and it's, it's bigger than in real life. And... Yeah, 1992, what they did was just film the kid, you know, like, probably in front of, like, a green screen or something, and then once they were, you know, and, and yeah, have the other actors pretend, oh, you know, the baby's really big, you know, look how, look how tall he is, and then, you know, in, in, you know, with special effects and editing, insert the the baby once they they you know make him bigger in in the special effects editing bay they could have done that here there's there's really no good reason like i i can think of maybe one part where it's like okay you really don't want to you know have a have a dog there but just you know for for one thing you could use cgi for that and for another that thing could have been off screen and it's just, again, it's just it's one of, it's another one of these baffling decisions, and it's like they don't even the fact that it's CG actually does bring up other issues than just bad CG. There's one point where a character is like looking, you know, you have the massive teleporting dog, and then you have characters near the dog, and you have this this character who's talking to the characters next to the giant dog. And suddenly they teleport, and the character just keeps looking at where the other characters were. I, I I don't know if maybe 
th that actor just was not directed to no, no no like there's a giant dog right here you know I'm sorry but if a giant dog teleports away you know yeah if it and people that I'm talking to teleport away I'm gonna look at the dog I'm I'm not gonna keep looking at the the people I'm gonna look at the the giant dog that's disappearing in front of my eye like yeah and yeah some of the stunts are actually good I, I wish that the the fighting cinematography allowed me to, to see it better on Disney Plus there are no extras for the show and yeah um, I think ultimately where I land is three meandering messes out of ten and yeah um, I, I feel I almost feel bad comparing this to to the other the other shows that it at all you know is related to but just to have it yeah um the the let's see I have it right here yeah um you know the the other yeah um, um the other Marvel the other MCU TV shows that had come out before this one, you know, yeah, comparing it to those, if we're talking overall, yeah, actually, yeah, whether we're talking overall season, season finale, or season opener, you know, this is the very worst, then Agent Carter season one, Agent Carter season two, and then Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. season one, two, three, and four in that order, and yeah, the, the, I don't know. I I feel like is it is it unfair to compare it to because to, I guess originally this wasn't supposed to be. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna. Yeah, since this does did not have what the what the Disney Plus ones do as far as like. Yeah. I'll I'll leave it at that, but yeah. Um, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what was your favorite worst moment of this show. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or more links to stuff like relevant playlists. I suggest a video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. I do. A weekly one talking about a horror thing right now I am near the very end of season one of Ash vs. Evil Dead I do a weekly one about a Star Wars thing which these days is of course th season three of Star Wars the Bad Batch I try to do a daily one of one of these Marvel TV shows. Recently I've been doing better at making sure to do one every single day. There was a while where it wasn't every single day. And yes, now that I'm done with this, starting tomorrow I will be doing Season 5 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And and once I've done Season 5, it's the other show. I'm, I'm doing them in the order they were released. Now... Uh, yeah, recently we've been thoughts videos, tending about very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video instead of in a separate video, since a movie's running time is significantly shorter than a show. In other words, if more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalogs, so what's kept on next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching recording. I'll catch you next time. I am so relieved to be done with this show.